Welcome back Nerglings. Today we are talking Munda. But before we start, be sure to like, share and subscribe so you don't miss an update. For over 7,000 years, House Helmar has ruled over Necromunda in one form or another making it one of the oldest noble families in the Segmentum Solar, and certainly the oldest on Necromunda. Necromunda has been part of the Imperium for 10,000 years, brought into compliance by the Imperial Fists Legion during the Great Crusade. Few reliable records of Necromunda remain from these early centuries, and those that do tell of a world suffering from almost constant warfare. During this lost age, Necromunda repeatedly rebelled against the Imperium, and the Adeptus Terror was forced to send forces to pacify the planet more than once. After three millennia of strife, a true leader at last emerged from the throngs of corrupted Hive Lords and savage Gang Kings. Martek Helmyar, a street tough from the drudging hands of Hive Primus, led a war of conquest, first within his own Hive, then out across the wastes of Necromunda. House Helmar's progenitor remains an enigmatic figure within the histories of Necromunda, though if the grandiose statues and paintings in the spire of Hive Primus are to be believed, he was ten feet tall and impossibly handsome. Inscriptions on these statues and paintings also claim Martek was the fittest man in all Necromunda, able to walk the wastes without a respirator, and also a great dancer. Martek and his reign have been largely lost to history, though rumour has it that within the Spear of Dawn, the Imperial Fist's fortress atop Hive Primus, there is a fresco of one of the few remaining true images of Martek Helmyar kneeling before an Imperial Fist's captain, taking the oath of governance. After centuries of able rulers and countless attempts by the other great houses of Necromunda to unseat House Helmar, Martek's line had begun to stagnate. By the 37th millennium, the House of Helmar was succumbing to decadence and decline, its rulers often more interested in personal excesses than governance. Voss the Younger spent his rule in a gas-induced coma, while his followers were forced to listen to his dreaming whispers for their commands. Targon III created chaos when he moved his entire court to the Underhive to escape the incessant criticism of Necromunda's moons, while Dagon the Scaled spent years indulging in horrific genetic experiments on himself and his kin. It was not until the death of Hyrodor Helmar, however, some time in the midpoint of the 37th millennium, that Necromunda faced the greatest threat to the Pax Imperium since the Second Great Pacification. Hyrodor left two children with equal claims to rule, Lady Sendarak and Lord Gothrul. While this was not the first time a Lord or Lady Helmar had died without a clear line of succession, not that nominating a heir always works, more than one Lord or Lady Helmar secured their position by progressively moving up the line of succession. It was complicated by the fact that the two siblings lived on opposite sides of the planet. Lady Cinderak resided in Hive Primus, and Lord Gothrul in the Nido. Each had their own armies and massive power bases. What followed was known as the Two-Faced War, as the two Helmars fought for rulership 
all the time being careful not to let things get out of hand, lest the Imperium intervene. And if you are a planetary governor, you do not want the Imperium to intervene in your affairs, as this usually involves orbital bombardment and guardsmen shooting up the place. In the end, Cinderak emerged victorious, and Gothral got a hive named after him. Some say his remains are still beneath it somewhere. In the more recent times, few have seriously opposed the rule of House Helmar, and succession has passed from one generation to the next with a minimum of disruption, not that there hasn't been the odd assassination or strange occurrence. In 646M41, Marius Helmar was killed in his bed by the Underhive gang leader Dogpit Karg. How a scummer like Karg made it into the spire, let alone the inner sanctum of the Lord of Necromunda, still remains a mystery. Some say the assassination had something to do with a debt owed by Marius to House Delac. Others say it wasn't a debt but a secret Marius couldn't be trusted with. Of course, Marius' eldest son, Tiberius, who succeeded him to rule, didn't waste too much time looking into it. That House de Lac won a number of Imperial House contracts during those first years of Tiberius' reign probably has nothing to do with Marius' death. The current Lord Helmar, Geronitus, is perhaps the most formidable Helmar to hold the title of Lord of Necromunda for a hundred generations. Born under auspicious astrological signs and a rare convergence of Necromunda's three largest moons, it was whispered among the seers of High Primus that Geronitus might be the last of his line. Despite these dark portents, Geronitus quickly made his mark upon the world. Under his rule, the planet has prospered like never before, despite record levels of conflict between the clan houses and their proxies. By his command, the ghast harvests of the Forbidden Cities flourished, and enemies, like the rebel lords of Aratheus, were weeded out and exterminated. No, more so the Imperial House supposes. Geronitus. Geronitus has done much to secure the legacy of his family, siring dozens of sons and daughters, some of whom are more capable and less homicidal than others. Most of his children resent their father his long life and his reluctance to give up power. They're also not fond of Geronitus's pet caryatid, Blinky, who many of his offspring believe he knows more than any of them, which is not without justification, considering Blinky has more staff to see to his need than most Spire nobles. Today, Geronitus keeps his court in the Spire of High Primus, surrounded by throngs of advisors and bodyguards. One eye is focused on the billions toiling for his benefit, and the other on the Imperium, lest they meddle in his affairs. Spire upon spire, the hives climb so far above the poisoned clouds, they pierce the planet's atmosphere. Each hive is a diverse and complete world, as isolated from the surrounding ash wastes and adjoining hives as from deep space and the distant stars. No one knows how old the hives of Necromunda are. Their very size is testament to many thousands of years of growth, sprawling layer upon layer climbing ever higher above the planet's polluted surface. The deepest and oldest layers now lie far underground, and now they are dark and dangerous places, inhabited only by mutant things, spawned by chemical pollutants, disease, and madness. 
Where the hive breaks the surface, its broad base spans ten miles or more from edge to edge. From ground level, the man-made mountain rises ever more steeply upwards. Weathered walls of adamantium climb through the phosphorant layer of undercloud, a pale of acidic dust which clings to the surface of Necromunda like a shroud. The hive reaches skyward through ghostly shadow until it eventually penetrates the cloud base and emerges into the hard light of the sun. At cloud level, the hive walls stand almost five miles above the ash waste. Above the dust layer, the hive narrows into a single tall spike, a tower studded with a million lights. It stretches almost vertically above the sickly glowing cloud and reaches towards the stars. The spire is covered with armor-class blisters of many shapes and sizes. Domes on its surface shield carefully nurtured vegetation from the thin, arid air. Slim towers break from the outer shell. Palaces of massive and elegant proportions, yet barely significant in comparison to the hive. Balconies, hundreds of meters long, jut out into open space, forming the base of new construction sites. Broad, circular landing platforms hang from the spire walls, and higher still, gaping black holes lead to spaceports inside the hive. Such are the hives of Necromunda, from their dark roots to their glittering tips. Each hive is a complete self-contained world, as varied and complex as any planet in the vast Imperium. A man born in the middle layer of a hive can live and die without seeing Necromunda's sky or setting foot upon the surface. He can labour in guild factories or perhaps ply the trade of his family. In this way, the vast majority devote their lives and their endeavours to creating the massive wealth of the world. Not all men are content to serve in the timeless fashion. A small minority dream of better things. Some crave wealth, power, or simply to escape from bludgeoning poverty. Others seek to escape the restrictions of the guilds, or the crippling social order of house and hive. Whatever their reasons, there is no shortage of young adventurers willing to chance all for a taste of wealth, prestige, and power. The most important hive on Necromunda is Hive Primus, sometimes known as Hive One. Hive Primus is the largest and oldest hive. Within its walls there are thousands of structural cells, many often miles across and hundreds of meters high. Such a space can be built up with constructions as varied as sumptuous palaces and sprawling industrial complexes. The hive is honeycombed with domes, both small and large each built upon the other, linked by tunnels and shafts, carrying traffic, power, and other vital surfaces throughout the hive. The hive is divided into vertically ordered zones, from its top to its subterranean depths. These are the Spire, Hive City, the Underhive, and Hive Bottom. The spire extends upwards from cloud top level, rising above the mass of the hive and piercing the planet's atmosphere. This is the domain of the seven great clans, the noble houses, huge consortiums of galactic merchants and financiers whose leaders control the immense wealth of the planet. The most powerful of the noble houses is House Helmar, also known as the Imperial, or the Ruling House. 
The leader of this house is House Geromitus Helmar, Adeptus of the Imperium of Man, and Guardian of Necromunda in the holy name of the Undying Emperor. He rules not just Hive Primus, but all of Necromunda. The spire contains broad, airy spaces and splendors unimaginable to those who dwell in the darkness below. Its people enjoy the fruits of a civilization that spans the galaxy, from spaceports sunk deep into the spire walls, ships carry the products of Necromunda all over the Imperium. And in return, the riches of the galaxy flow into the hive, exotic foods, sensuous slaves, exquisite artwork, and raw materials from distant stars. Below the lowest level of the spire is a layer of solid adamantium called the Wall, which divides the towering upper hive from Hive City. Heavy gateways through the wall enable carefully controlled passage between the two parts of the hive. Beneath the wall lies the vast bulk of the working hive, the five mile deep Hive City that extends from cloud level to the ground. Hive City is divided between six manufacturing empires, each known as Houses. Each house exists in its own part of the Hive, and governs its own affairs quite separately from the others. The Hivers, as the population are commonly called, live in dark, cramped and polluted conditions, never seeing the sun from the day they are born until the day they die. The air they breathe is recycled from above and grows ever more bitter and poisonous as it filters downwards. Even the water is distilled from the discharge of the upper hive, and their food is factory-produced chemical nutrient, algae-based, or spun from corpse starch. Conditions are crowded and insanitary, and as the hive deepens, the darker and less habitable the environment becomes. In the depths of Hive City, it is common for power or water to fail, or access tunnels to collapse, creating unproductive toxic waste zones. The lower the region, the worse its air, its power and access, the more unstable the structure. As the hive deepens, normal habitation becomes impossible, and this region is known as the Underhive. There is no formal barrier between Hive City and the Underhive, because the border is constantly changing. Even as areas of Hive City are abandoned, parts of the Underhive are resettled and rebuilt. As a consequence, the Underhive is an ever-changing frontier, where people are constantly seeking new opportunities or fleeing from sudden catastrophe. The Underhive is a frontier in more ways than one. Not only is it a barrier between Hive City and the unimaginable horrors of Hive Bottom, it is also a region outside the formal law and order of the Hive. The people of Hive City live carefully regulated lives. They are protected by the strict social codes of house and hive, dominated by family patriarchs, and obliged to work in the guild factories. The sprawling underhive is lawless and anarchic. Its stockaded settlements form the only havens of relative order. Even in these refugees, murder and violence are everyday facts of life. Gun law is the most common law, and self-protection is the best and only reliable defense. At the base of the hive, buildings become so structurally dangerous that the region takes on a different and even more inhospitable character. This is the final and deepest zone, Hive Bottom. Hive Bottom is so decayed and crumbling that the original domes and foundation piles have so long since collapsed, forming a layer of almost solid rubble. Within the rubble are enclosed pockets, linked by holes and tunnels worn by liquids leaking from above. 
these pollutants and effluents, the discharge fluid of the entire hive, form a vast lake of radioactive putridity called the sump. Nothing can live in hive bottom other than the most monstrous mutants. Its denizens are the spawn of darkness and pollution. Some of these foul creatures find their way into the underhive, or even to the lower parts of Hive City, but their natural domain is the darkness of Hive Bottom. The Fist Located halfway up the massive western face of Hive Primus, set above the rustling nexus, but well below the glowing, gleaming lower ridges of the spire, what? The fist. Set into a ragged hole in the side of the hive, a place long abandoned by other clan houses. The savage house of chains has made its home. Only the rugged physiology of a goliath could hope to prosper here, so exposed it is to the toxic atmosphere of the hive world. Any normal hiver, taking a lungful of the polluted air of the fist, would be soon rasping their lasts as their organs blistered and burst. A powerhouse of every industry and smelting, the hammering forges of the fist ring out across the wastes, drowning out even the constant drone of the hive's great storm turbines. Each propeller is the size of a city and is used to direct the worst of the ashen gales away from the hive's shell. Most of the high-grade alloys used in Hive Primus' thousands of manufactoria come from the Fist, and it's a measure of the work of the Goliaths that the guilds and great houses alike pay well for the clan's hammer-stamped metals. Of course, the Fist was not always the industrial hellhole it is today. Not so long ago, it was a completely different kind of hellhole. After a stricken orbital shuttle crashed into the area where the fist would one day stand, it was abandoned for centuries. Considered too toxic and too badly damaged to be of any use to anyone, nearby domes were sealed off and servitor work crews were directed to leave its fate to the elements. It was not until the early years of M38 and the emergence of the Goliaths that it was to see human habitation again. So the story goes, a Goliath Alpha by the name of Rackon Fist escaped the slaver's noose by climbing out onto the shell of Hive Primus, scaling the great hive and seeking shelter in the ruin. Wounded and bleeding, Rackon was set upon by an army of hairless rats, some the size of fear cats. Fashioning armor and weapons from the scrap around him, Rackon waged war on them, cleaning out the ruin, laying claim to it for its people. In memory of these deeds, or perhaps because it just amuses the local Goliaths, in each great cycle, the Goliath is chosen to recreate the deeds of Rackon. The fighter is hurled naked into a fighting pit filled with starving rats and cheered on by their clanmates as they punch, kick, and bite their way to victory. They cheer even louder when the rats win. It is not without good cause that Clan Goliath is known as the House of Chains. Hundreds of thousands of slaves infest the fist, toiling at all those tasks the Goliaths themselves are either ill-suited to or consider beneath them. Be it sweeping the boiling floors of the great factories, running the Medicaid hubs, or cleaning the intricate workings of a renderizer, a task that requires surprisingly dainty fingers. To keep this slave population from choking to death on the thick atmosphere of the fist, something only Goliath lungs can truly endure, most slaves are shackled to their workstations by long snaking breathing tubes. Groups of slaves may even be linked to the same tube network, making it easy for a Goliath to lead them about by simply hauling the rebreather unit on their back, the slaves trailing along like giant rats on a leash. This system also makes it easier for the Goliaths to chastise a slave that might be slacking on the job. There is nothing more motivating than having your air ration cut up to a production quota. The Goliaths are not 
especially cruel masters, however, and some say they lack the imagination to be truly sadistic towards their drudges, like some of the other great houses are known to be. This, of course, doesn't extend to the Goliath's love of pit fighting, and it's almost inevitable that a slave owned by the House of Chains will, at some point, end up in the pits, and in the first, that means a trip to the House of Pain. One of the largest arenas in High Primus, the House of Pain, is a smoke-shrouded coliseum that echoes daily to the sound of roaring Goliath crowds and the screams of its combatants. It is a great honour for a Goliath to have fought in the House of Pain, and legends like Attilius the Axe made their name here. Over Tyrant Harren Gore has painted its iron floor crimson with his chain blades. Ajax Gorgoth, the Alpha of the Fist, wisely keeps the House of Pain packed, lest his Goliath workers grow bored after a full cycle at the forge, and all manner of fighters and creatures grace the arena each evening shift. Some are mundane matches between coolly trained good slaves or augments like chrono gladiators. The crowd wagering if the gladiator will fill their opponent before the bomb strapped to their chest goes off. Others are more exotic, and House Escher supplies Ajax with countless horrors found out in the wastes, the depths of the underhive, or born in their labs, all for the pleasure of the crowd. Vast amounts of ore pour into the fist from all of mines surrounding Hive Primus. Raw materials brought in as far afield as the spoil to feed the Goliath smelters. It's said that land trains approaching Hive Primus from the west can pick out the glow of the fist on the side of the great city, even through the toxic gloom of Necromunda's putrid atmosphere. As they draw closer, the sounds of its hydraulic metal hammers ring out as they churn out in ceaseless supply of finished ingots. More than once, another clan house has thought to capture the hugely valuable factories of the Fist and use their manufacturing capabilities for themselves. Even though Lord Helmire is swift to punish open warfare between the clan houses, he encourages limited exchanges in the interests of pushing up production quotas and trimming dead meat from the population. In recent times, House Escher, on behalf of the noble House of Alanti, uh, tried to poison the population of the Fist, introducing a new strain of lung scowl into the settlement's ventilators. The result almost wiped out the slave population of the Fist, countless drudges bursting in crimson showers as their rebreathers pumped the chem into them. Not a single Goliath perished, although some did comment on the air having an odd smell that morning. Far more worrying for Ajax Gorgoth and the other Alphas was the Ogryn slave uprising of 989. Organised around a charismatic some say he could even say his name without pausing between each syllable. Ogre and Pit Fighter named Sparky Three, not to be confused with any of the other Sparkies that have led Ogre in uprisings. The great brutes rampaged through the fist for three long cycles. Goliath's slaves and visiting guilders all felt their wrath, and it might have gone on longer, or threatened the rest of the hive, had Sparky Three not led his people to freedom down the wrong tunnel causing the entire uprising to charge off the edge of the fist and plummet to their doom outside the hive. Necromunda is a world of prodigious industrial output, and no hive is productive as Hive Primus. The boundaries of Hive City, as laid out by Helvar's Primaria Geograph, State it begins where a man may lay a foot upon the ash of Hive Base, and ends where one may touch the Imperial Seals of the Wall. In reality, it conforms to no absolute defined border, parts of it reaching down into the Underhive, or crawling up the outside of the Hive to cling to the lower levels of the Spire. It is home to countless industries, from munitions plants to corpse reclamation farms. Its residents live with 
the constant rumble of factories and machines rising through the floors of their hubs or echoing down from domes overhead. To live in Hive City is to live in the heart of a great machine. Though no serious attempt has ever been made to map Hive City, the clan houses, being somewhat resistant to people poking around their domains, for it is rumored that when Surveyor Sikas Gelin was compiling his legendary ap Apocrypha, he had to complete numerous grueling dinner engagements just to even get the vaguest information on the domains of the clan houses. The Hive City can be broadly divided into a number of regions. The lowest level of Hive City is known as the Circulum Nexus, or Cargo Town to the locals. Here, dozens of subterranean maglev trains converge and scores of great ash gates lead out to the wastes. The Nexus rings the outer section of the Hive and is dedicated to the receiving, the storing, and the sorting of the endless chain of cargo shipments. Vast warehouses characterize this level, each filled with endless lines of stacked containers, piled so high they reach up out of sight into the gloom. Entire towns exist in the artificial canyons created by these containers, their inhabitants endlessly numbering and checking each container to ensure it reaches its intended destination. At various points, the Nexus breaks through into the Underhive below. The most notable of these is the Gilda's Pit, which leads down to Dust Falls. Above the Nexus is the region known as Forge City. Here, the heaviest industries operate, smelting ores and cooking chemicals to feed the factorums above. These industries expel a huge amount of waste, their runoff cascading down the hive shell to the ash heaps below. As the industrial domes and chambers of Forge City thin out, the teeming begins. This is the living core of Hive City, where most of its hubs and industries reside, each providing and producing everything from Lasgun focusing crystals to Adeptus Terra sanctioned spoons. The punishment for making a unsanctioned spoon is swift and harsh, and usually involves the spoon in question. Within this tangle of subsidies, there are a number of noteworthy landmarks, such as the Grand Plaza, where a massive statue of the Emperor, or Lord Helmar, holds the dome aloft, or the Lumen Halls, where the Master Overseers gather to read the endlessly scrolling production numbers of the Hive and set their punishing quotas. The teeming is also home to Penitent's Vault. This vast Gilda prison houses miscreants of all kinds and sizes and shapes as they await execution, or exile, or slavery. Sitting atop the teeming like a crown is the Primus spaceport. While hundreds of landing pads and hangars stood the outside of Hive Primus, the largest concentration can be found on the edge of the world's toxic cloud layer, where Hive City gives way to the Spire. A city in itself, the spaceport never sleeps, with gleaming stratoplanes, massive orbital haulers, and sleek landers all endlessly taking off and setting down Running along the upper reaches of the Primus spaceport is the Wall. This is the hard barrier between Half City and the Spire, dividing the clan houses from the noble houses, protecting the privileged elite who dwell above. It is a grave offense for a subject to even approach within sight of the Wall without permission. 
the punishment inevitably is death. An estimated 5 to 10 billion people work and live within Hive City. These range from clanners serving one of the great clan houses to the Helot workers who make up the Hive's drudging classes. The clans are the de facto rulers of Hive City, and their domains reflect their importance. Nation states in their own right, each one dominates a region of Hive City. The Orlocks control much of the Nexus, and many of the Ash Gates that lead to it, in the name of the Guild of Coin. Goliaths rule that city, constantly expanding their realm to make room for even greater furnaces and new arena towns filled with fighting pits. The Van Saar and Escher, as befits their rank as the oldest clan houses, dwell largely in the upper reaches of the teeming, controlling parts of the spaceport and the domes that cling to the underside of the wall. Cordor and Delac are different in that their clans can be found almost anywhere in Hive City, the Cordor thriving in every disused nook and cranny, the Delac appearing mysteriously where they are least expected. It is rumored that the Delac long ago destroyed all direct links to their parts of Hive City, and even Lord Helmar doesn't know precisely where their center of power is located. With so many people and so many competing interests, violence within Hive City is carefully monitored by Lord Helmar. While the streets of the teeming or the cargo canyons of the Nexus are far from safe, there is order of a sort, maintained by the Palanite enforcers. Thus do the clan houses work out their grievances in the lawless expanse of the Underhive, lest the precarious and ancient peace of Hive City ever be broken by open warfare, and the whole system comes crashing down. Hive cities, by their nature, are microcosms of human society. Millions of citizens concentrated into a towering metropolis of plasteel and ferrocrete. Sealed, mostly at least, against the hostile atmosphere of Necromunda, these societies endure via ancient mechanical systems and brutal feudalism. Yet, even a self-contained city needs connection to the outside world. Gatehouses, landing grounds, and ash ports each form gateways to the toxic world beyond. One such place is the settlement of Port Mad Dog. Every cycle, whether under sickly moonlight or the feeble rays of Necromunda's sun, billions of tons of weapons and other equipment are shipped in through Hive Primus, and then off-world through the Eye of Selene in low orbit. These goods come from the Hive itself, the surrounding hives of the Palatine Cluster, and hundreds of more distant hives. The finest goods, such as crystal toothpicks, fancy hats, and pure drinking water, are brought in by stratoplane heavy lifters, flown over the toxic cloud layers from one hive to the next. The most valuable mass-produced goods arrive via transit tubes or what remains of the old underground maglev lines that still connect much of Necromunda. For the rest, overland convoys haul all kinds of material and finished goods across the wastes. And when they reach Hive Primus, it is through the great ash gates that they are brought. The largest of these gates is the one at Port Mad Dog, a settlement which clings to the edge of Hive City Primus and sprawls out into the wastes. Such is the importance of Port Mad Dog that it is ruled with an iron fist by the coin lords of the Makata Gelt, the Gilders, given special authority by the Imperial House to ensure the flow of cargo never stops. It is a responsibility that Hagar Cripplefingers, Lord Miser of the local Mercantor Gelt family, takes very seriously, and gangs from Dust Falls to Big Hole 
know that if you want easy creds, Hagar is always willing to pay for hired guns to keep the peace. Hagar's peace, of course, usually involves making sure the Guild of Coin is making money, whilst his rivals go begging. Hagar's longshore clanners make sure that any acceptable losses permitted by the Imperial House are confined to the families of guilds other than his own. A long-standing rivalry between the Guild of Coin and the Slave Guild has seen violence erupt more than once between rival clans and gangs on the streets of Port Mad Dog. It doesn't help that the settlement's exposure to the wastes means it exists in a perpetual twilight of ash clouds and toxic fog. The massive stab lights of the primary loading dome struggling to illuminate the clustered hubs and slave pens that nestle among the long rows of Gilda warehouses. In this poisonous gloom, murder comes easy, and body peddlers make a good living clearing up the streets after each night cycle. Most of the conflict in Port Mad Dog is centred on the massive ore conveyors. Once, these were just huge lifts designed to transport land trains up from the ash roads. Over the centuries, the conveyors have been covered with ramshackle structures that have turned them into moving shanty towns, each one a settlement in its own right. While a conveyor is making the ponderous journey from the ground to the port, its inhabitants, its passengers, are cut off, and many gangs use this opportunity to strike. However, woe to the gang who gets caught mid-heist when the conveyor reaches level with the port. Auto cannon turrets and flamers prove Hagar has a zero tolerance policy when it comes to messing with Gilda trade. This does not stop the gangs. The Sump City sirens enjoyed a long run raiding Gilda convoys, ambushing them on the conveyors before rappelling down into the wastes to safety. Their run may have continued had Hagar not hidden hundreds of murder servitors in the shipments targeted by the sirens. Occasionally, workers still open a mysterious crate and get stabbed in the face. Given its location on the edge of Hive Primus, linked to the Hive itself, the upper reaches of the Underhive are the Spider Points, the Ash Road network that still connects the Hives of the Palatine Cluster. Port Mad Dog is a natural habitat for scum of all kinds. For outlaws and criminals, it offers a connection to the sanctioned organisations of the Hive, like the guilds or the clan houses, allowing them to move illegal goods or visit established trading posts. The famous Mad Dog Fog also works in their favour, as it's hard to identify a ganger when you can't see more than a few yards and everyone is wearing a respirator. Wanderers from Ash Waste Nomads to Mutines also frequent the dust markets of Fort Mad Dog, selling items they've found out in the wastes and buying goods only found within the hives, like reliable weapons and foodstuffs. Of course, Hagar doesn't like these wanderers in the settlement proper, so they are confined mostly to the shanty sprawl beneath the conveyors. Known as the Ash Heap, this is a warren of adobe, ash brick, and corroded sheet metal huts. Periodic purges ensure that Ash Heap doesn't get too big, although even when an ash storm inevitably obliterates it, its residents emerge from their pits to build it once more. The most interesting residents of Port Mad Dog could be found in the Hall of Bullets. Here, in an old imperial shrine paved with spent shell casings, bounty hunters and hive scum come to sell their services to prospective gangs, crime bosses, and guild leaders. Buyers can walk among the alcoves as the hired guns brag about their deeds, show off their skills with pistols and blades. Fighters like Mad Dog Mono and Janus Gore got their starts in the Hall of Bullets. It remains the first stop for many gangers when they come to Port Mad Dog, looking to buy some extra muscle or sell their skills at killing. From crazed Xenos infected cultists and worshippers of profane powers, to psychopathic seditionists and rogue psychers. 
most hide deep in the bud zones, lest the long arm of the law reach them. But some have made a home for themselves among the criminal cartels and gang bosses, gaining a measure of acceptance by the underhivers. Far from the inhabited regions of the underhive, where a few still functioning floodlights and guttering lumens grow faint, ancient paths and tunnels lead to Heretic's Hall. Only the most dedicated travelers come this far, the journey in itself almost as dangerous as the destination. And yet, through the tangled bad zones of the Outlands, the settlement endures, built into the hull of an ancient spaceship, itself jutting from a lake of slime. So old is the vessel that houses Heretic's Hall, that it confirms to no known imperial pattern. Only the barely legible human script on its hull, A-N-A-R, hinting at its origins. The ramshackle town clings to the partially sunken ship like some kind of obscene growth, its citizens living inside gaps between hull plating gloomy cargo holds and the ship's flame-scarred engine mount. The most prominent inhabitants of Heretic's Hall reside in the vessel's rusting conning tower. These twisted spires rise up from the town center at an alarming angle, but provides an excellent vantage to see anyone approaching the settlement, and also pump them full of lead, thanks to a number of heavy stubber turrets. The people of Heretic's Hall are as you would expect for such a lawless and remote place. They are the scum and the outlaws, who have been thrown out of more respectable places like Dust Falls or Rust Town, or those who find themselves with a pressing need to disappear. As an outlaw settlement, no one is turned away from its gates, provided they are willing to respect its ruler, Urson Graves, the current overlord of Heretic's Hall. He only has one rule. If you do something he does not like, he will kill you. Graves and his cabal of lost ones have survived due to no small part to the Overlord's psychic gifts of precognition. Rumor has it that he was once one of Lord Helmar's slave psychers, reared in the psychonarium of the Spire and put to work hunting down recidivists. After escaping, he went the only place he believed to be beyond the reach of the Palanite Enforcers, that place being Heretic's Hole. Since then, Graves and his covens of weirds have had to contend with numerous gang assaults, zombie outbreaks, and the odd wandering sump horror attracted by the big metal tin full of crunchy things. In recent times, the crime lord Balthazar Van Zepp has taken an interest in Heretic's Hall and its access to the Hive Autumn as a means of circumventing the monopoly on spider eyes and deep sump fungi held by the rulers of Sump City. So far, however, Graves has countered every one of Balthazar's moves and sent the Crime Lord's agents back to him in pieces. Urson Graves' open door policy on Outer Laws has its drawbacks, however. While the welcoming atmosphere has seen his motley collection of weirds grow, it has also seen some less than desirable elements take root. For as long as Heretic's Hole has existed, it has been a favoured haunt of Corridor gangs. 
The frontier nature of the settlement meant it served as a good forward base for scavenging expeditions into the outer bad zones of the Underhive, while the non-judgmental locals didn't seem to mind the lax personal hygiene of the ragged gangers. Graves tolerate them, provided they direct their religious zeal towards the bad zones and not his subjects. It is, however, not a perfect system. Over the years, Graves has clashed with Cordor, who thought that they could clean up Heretic's Hole. Each time, though, the gangers have come off the worst for it. Like the time old Tim the Preacher's head exploded in the middle of giving a rousing speech about killing weirds. Old Tim's flock later claimed it was the best sermon he'd ever performed, and there were even reports of spontaneous applause the moment the preacher's brain was physically destroyed. Or, of course, the time the Pipe Rats gang tried to attack the lower tower and were all found the next day, somehow inexplicably turned inside out. Recently, however, a new and more insidious threat has started taking root in the settlement. A collection of outlaw Cordor gangs have taken up residence in Heretic's Hole, calling themselves the Cult of the True Resurrection. Outcasts from the clan house, they believe that only with the death of the Emperor and his domain can the galaxy be reborn and they will spread their message to all who will listen, and some who will not. Mostly will not. Part of their crazed beliefs also espouses self-mutilation, the cult cutting off limbs, putting out eyes, and carving their own flesh to show their devotion to the notion that all things must die. Most of the other inhabitants of Heretic's Hole avoid those areas controlled by the true resurrection, but their influence is building. More worrying than their dark beliefs is that they have found purchase in other settlements, such as Sub City and Dust Falls, converting those dedicated to the redemption or who have lost all hope or reason. Though Graves keeps an eye on the cult and its activities, they are not his main concern. He has learnt there is a secret war going on within House Cordor between the traditionalists of the Redemption and extremists such as those who believe in the path of the true resurrection. It is a war Graves fears might one day find its way to his town and one he prepares for every day by bringing in new outlaw gangs and more weirds for his lost ones. The true value of Heretic's Hole for Underhive gangs comes not from its criminal elements or black markets, but rather its large collection of weirds. Outlaws willingly brave the strange occurrences of the settlement like ghostly apparitions of long-dead gangers or reflective surfaces showing glimpses of the future with the hope of contracting the services of one of Graves' lost ones. For most outlaw gangs, the risk of employing a psychic hired gun is no more dangerous than spending a night cycle out in the bad zones or eating at Heretic Hole's main drinking port the Slopper's Grave. It said there are actual Sloppers buried under its kitchen floor. Annoyingly, many weirds tend to find gangs before the gangs even go looking for them. More than one visitor to the settlement has been greeted by the gates by a shifty looking individual claiming their fates are intertwined. Sometimes these individuals even turn out to be genuine psychers. Psychic phenomena are a daily occurrence in Heretic's Hole. Hive wisps are often seen lurking at the edges of the settlement, luring gangers out into the wilds and their inevitable doom. 
are sometimes two hidden stashes, giving credence to the belief that they are the spirits of dead hivers. Frost creeps around the chambers of the void ship with a life of its own, while ancient dead screens might suddenly flicker to life, showing glowing eyes, grasping hands, or grinning fangs. Gangers might even experience heretic's luck, which is often another way of saying misfortune. Guns jam at the most inopportune time, or perfectly good blades become dull whilst in their sheaths. Perhaps the most notorious incident related to these phenomena was when Venators came for Joe twice shy and tried to execute him outside the slopper's grave. After three broken ropes, two failed beheadings, and every gun the Venators had misfiring, they decided the bounty wasn't worth the effort and gave Joe a job instead. Necromunda is an ancient world, its endless ash deserts littered with half-buried ruins and lost settlements, and only the nomadic tribes and the mutant creatures who walk the wastes truly knows what lies beyond the walls of the hive cities. However, there are places so infamous even the clan gangs know their name, such as the ship graveyard known as Navis Mortis. Thousands of years before the birth of the current Lord Helmar, there was a schism within the Imperial House. In 459.M37, Lord Hirodo Helmar died suddenly whilst on a hunting expedition without naming an heir. He was hunting servants through the upper regions of the spire when one of his cyber mastiffs accidentally mistook the Lord of Necromunda for one of his own retainers. His two eldest children, Lady Cinderak and Lord Garthul, both shared a claim to the mantle of planetary governor, and they fought each other bitterly for over a century for the right to rule. Eventually, Cinderak triumphed and imprisoned Garthul within his hive the Needle, which had been one of Necromunda's first spaceports. To cement her control of Necromunda, she constructed the Eye of Selene, part space station, part trading hub, and declared all inbound off-world goods and all outbound planetary production would now pass solely through Hive Primus. In the centuries that followed, Hundreds of ship captains thought to brave this blockade and land at the Needle. Cinderak proved the worth of her words, and as the years ground by, the wastes around the Needle grow thick, with vessels shot down by the Eye of Selene and the Necromundan system fleet. To the nomads, it was known as the time of raiding iron for not a cycle passed without a flaming wreck falling from the sky, and the growing field of wreckage soon became known as the Navis Mortis. Despite a rich picking ground, Cinderak declared the region off-limits. She refused to let anyone profit from cargoes carried by the dead captains, and soon the borders of the crash zone were heavily patrolled by the armored ashrunners of the Palanite enforcers. Of course, where there is loot, there will be looters. As the centuries have slipped by, ship captains no longer try to run the blockade, and instead accept the hefty tariffs imposed for passing through the Eye of Selim. Smugglers still attempt to bring illegal goods to Necromunda, but usually do so far from the hives. Meanwhile, among the wrecks of the Navis Mortis, an ash waste society has sprung up. From their starship fortress, tribes wage war on each other and anyone foolish enough to enter the graveyard. Some are settled ash waste tribes who have put down roots, others are muties looking for a safe place to weather the constant ash storms, but many more are outlaws who have been driven out of the hives. 
Settlements and tribes take their names from the ships that they control, like the red-robed Oculidites, who live in the broken bowels of the heavy hauler, Oclid Dias. The Ash Terrors, who rule the wreck of Fleet Monitor Pax Terra. None of the Terrors can actually read, but upon hearing the name of their ship, and assuming it must be full of axes, they made it their hideout. Or even the trade settlement of Pilgrim's Grave, built beneath the gutted hall of the Milstorum Chartist vessel, the Solar Pilgrim. Clan houses, gangs, and guilders can be also found in the graveyard, drawn by the chance to find lost treasure. They come up the scrap roads from Gothrul's Needle, or down past the ruins of Hive Arcos, or from the north and the south, around the far edges of the Dust Wall. The Guild of Coin maintains trade towns around the edges of the Navis Mortis, patrolled by enforcers, ensuring Lord Helmar gets his cut of everything to come out of the graveyard. Visitors to the graveyard have to contend with the locals, powerful warlords that rule from the conning towers of the ship fortresses, commanding the wastes out to the range of their guns. The Noctus Riders are perhaps the largest of these gangs, their boss, the Humanagon, an eight-foot-tall masked savage who somehow awakened the Noctus's void shields. His main rivals, the Oculidites and the Sons of Ash, have at times challenged his rule, capturing nearby wreck fortresses and turning their guns on the Noctus. Inevitably, these ship-to-ship -ship engagements across vast deserts end in the Noctus' shields keeping it intact, whilst ancient lance weapons and macro cannons pound the other wrecks to dust. In recent years, the tribes, gangs, and settlements of the Navis Mortis have been forced to band together against a common foe, the Grave Worm. A vast underground brainleaf plant the worm extends out from its nest for hundreds of kilometers, its tendrils reaching up through the ash into dozens of wrecks. During Necromunda's long winter, the plant slumbers, and gangs risk warrens of brainleaf zombies to raid the ships it has infested. A few bold gang members, like the Orlock road boss Ajax Bones, have tried to even find the heart of the grave worm and kill it. Ajax, like so many before him, ended up vanishing into the graveyard, although one of his lieutenants, Wall-Eyed Joe, was later seen trying to eat somebody's brain. Witnesses are conflicted as whether Joe was a zombie or just really hungry. As the season of fire comes to the graveyard and Necromunda enters its summer cycle, the worm stirs. Amidst the seasonal ash storms and burning sun shafts that occasionally break through the planet's toxic cloud layer, hordes of brainleaf zombies shamble out across the desert. Made up of ash wasters, luckless scavengers, and even the long-dead crew of the ships themselves, these hordes seek to spread dominion of the Grave Worm. Five times the Pilgrim's Grave has been attacked. Gilders and gangers fighting shoulder to shoulder with outlaws and ash tribesmen to see off the undead. Each time, the hordes were larger and the margin of victory more narrow. About the only place safe from the worm seems to be the Noctus, its guns sweeping the desert clear of zombies as the Humanagon stands on its battlements, laughing. ancient even by the standards of the Imperium. Much of our knowledge of this industrial hive world is limited to the clan houses and their constant wars for supremacy, but there is so much more to discover. These works, based on Servator Gellin's seminoles, we will be shining a light on some of the peoples, regions, and settlements of Necromunda, delving down into that world's lore. First of all, let's have a look at the town of Dust Falls.
Dust falls, straddles the divide between Hive City and the underhive of Hive Primus, and is a centre for gangs, guilders, and criminals. Much like most things in the underhive, Dust Falls was created by chance. Much of the lower hive is made up of domes, each a cavern of plasteel pipes, factories, and hab blocks, all stacked up on top of each other. Between these domes, even more tunnels, conduits, and cables link everything together. Over centuries of neglect, the space between the domes gathers dust. A lot of dust, among other things. Imagine, if you will, a septic tank on your roof started leaking. Sometimes this dust builds up so much it causes a collapse. Such is the case with Dust Falls, an avalanche of powdery detritus smashing all the way down to Hive Bottom. Around the ragged hole left behind, the settlement of Dust Falls grew, a place where travellers from above and below could traverse the Hive. While the disaster that created the settlement has long since faded into memory, the dust still falls from above. A fine, pale rain that covers everything and gives the town its name. The wealth of Dust Falls comes from the Abyss. This is the name given to the yawning chasm that dominates the centre of the town. Scavengers, gangs and guilders all use its hanging cages to be lowered down and winched up and out of the Underhive. Given the depth of the Abyss, literally miles of dark all the way to Hive Bottom, landings have been built at various heights down the shaft face. Some lead to other settlements like Two Tunnels or Dead End Pass, whilst others have their own transport cages leading down into the bad zones below or even deeper. This area in the middle of the settlement is collectively known as The Gates and is why most people come to Dust Falls. The town itself hangs from the upper edges of the abyss and sprawls out into the wreckage around it left by the ancient avalanche. Roads wind their way through the morass and on towards Hive City above, and are constantly filled with traffic. The second most important part of Dust Falls is its markets, known locally as the Haggle Market or just the haggle. Here the wealth pulled up from the underhive is sold to traders from Hive City and tourists who visit the town for a taste of the wild frontier, though one that is not too far from home. The importance of Dust Falls also means that both the guilds and the clan houses have heavily invested in its infrastructure. Warehouse silos and gilder slave pits litter its outer streets. The town's larger structures are the fortified Trader's Tower, controlled by the Mercator Gelt and the Six Clans Drinking Hole, designated neutral ground by the clan houses. The size of Dustfall also affords it a Palanite and Porsa presence, and Precinct 1313 looms over the settlement entrance like a dark sentinel, its troopers watching travellers come and go through the sights of their guns. Like most underhive settlements, Dust Falls is a den of criminality, tempered by the greed of the Gilders and the brutality of Lord Helmar's enforcers. It is ruled over by a loose alliance of civic leaders and guild procurators, tolerated by the local enforcer Precinct Proctor. In fact, Proctor Claus Bauhain doesn't care much about the goings-on in Dust Falls, as long as the caravans keep running and the gates stay open. Only twice has the Proctor mustered the full might of his command. Once, it was to lock down the town when Lord Helmar's seventeenth son, Gilbarn was found passed out in the Haggle parlour room. The second time was during the Great Plague zombie outbreak of 93, famous for Barhen's Chief Sergeant Roscoe barging into the taproom of the Six Clans and deputising everyone sober enough to stand. The day-to-day -day running of the settlement falls to two individuals. 
mistress of coin Melivia, and narco lord Balthazar van Zepp. Together they govern the guild and criminal businesses respectively, and despite their differences, get along quite well. Gangs find equal employment with both, and there is more than enough wealth flowing out of the abyss for them to enjoy. This does not always prevent conflicts, as neither Maliva or Balthazar are the type to play with others. After all, in Dust Falls, death by crossing Malvira or Balthazar is the second most common cause of fatality, right behind drinking the Six Clans' second best. For the most part, Balthazar tolerates the hefty bribes he must pay to move Kems up into Hive City, whilst Maliva ignores the screams of those who displeased the Narco Lord as they are thrown headfirst into the Abyss. All told, Dust Falls works for the various parties involved in its dealings. Discounting the crazies, like the Brotherhood of the True Resurrection or the Hunter's Triumphiate, it is pretty safe by Necromundian standards making it one of the most important settlements in Hive Primus, as one of the gateways that guard the Underhive. Settlements spring up like weeds throughout the Underhive, and many perish just as quickly, most surviving for less than a great cycle before returning to the ruins from whence they came. It is therefore rare for a new hole to last, and even rarer for one to last in a place where hivers have no business living. Quite possibly the oddest thing about Rust Town is not its location in the middle of the Bone Dry, an old cistern as big as a solar freighter, once completely underwater, now long since turned into a vast open dust ball, far from the main tunnels and domes of the Underhive, but rather the fact that no one can say for sure how long it's existed. Some traders swear the isolated settlement only sprung up a few cycles ago, and claim to have crossed the Bone Dry dozens of times without ever laying eyes on it before then. Others reckon it to be among the oldest of the Underhive settlements, saying its foundations were laid long before the cataclysm that created Dust Falls, or before Sump City rose from the slime of Hive Bottom. Why it exists in the middle of what constitutes a man-made desert is unclear, though Hivers, Guilders, and Nobles all make the trek to its gates to trade and visit the court of Bold Byron. The enigmatic Byron, a tall, lanky man of indeterminate age and origin, is the self-proclaimed mayor of Dust Town. He rules over a settlement of hivers who are devoted to maintaining the Rust Town ruin, Bold Bryon's deadly dungeon extravaganza. Scrappers and scavengers bring in their finds from the Bone Dry, while caravans trade goods from further afield. But in Rust Town, the only thing the locals seem to produce are trinkets associated with their Rust Town run. These range from grinning Bryon, gum belts, and runner kill coins to genuine chrono crystal polishing kits. Even the town itself seems to exist solely for the run, its slanting streets and wonky buildings perched up on a plasteel hill containing the run itself. While Rust Town might not produce junk rounds, fungi paste, gunk, or any of the other substances useful to underhivers, it does have one thing in abundance. Entertainment. The Rust Town run is legendary throughout the Underhive. Even in Hive City and the Spire, people have heard of the run, and challengers from throughout Hive Primus, and even beyond, 
have been known to make the journey to try their luck in Brian's maze. Each great cycle, challengers are invited to brave the maze, these hopefuls entering into one of the mayor's lotteries, which are nothing as simple as drawing numbers or casting dice, and usually involve such entertainment as second best drinking contests, game of pinfinger, or run low roulette. Even for those who aren't chosen to run, a chance is offered for glory, this time as hunters. The hunters stalk the maze, trying to stop the runners reaching the goal, one of the fabled chrono crystals, and earn creds for each one they can take out. The run itself changes every time it is used, sometimes in subtle ways, such as a previously safe door now rigged with a deadly booby trap, or sometimes less subtle, like chambers being flooded with toxic chemicals or the entire run being filled out with plague zombies. Typically, the perils are those gangs might face out in the bad zones, ranging from the grinding teeth of ancient machinery to pitch black tunnels riddled with pitfalls. All this becomes even more challenging when hunters are shooting at the runners or trying to push them into pits of ripper jacks. While gangs rarely complete the run, each time it is held, the town's economy booms, and they grow rich on the thousands of credits bet on the outcome. Only a handful of gangs and individuals have ever won one of the runs and gained a chrono crystal. Some of these crystals are still in the hands of their original owners, though many have been lost, stolen, or sold. Hagen's Hole has one above the bar, sold to Hagen to cover an outlandish drinking tab by a notable underhive bounty hunter. Some drinkers do claim that the gem does strange things to the flow of time when you look at it, although that might just be the booze. One-Eyed Kitty, a blade dancer out of two tunnels, has one too, given to her by an admirer. When she dances, she wears the crystal in her navel, its sparkle mesmerizing the audience. Then there's the one owned by Costas the Chain Lord, set into the hilt of his shock lash. Its brilliance forms a stark contrast to the slaver's grimy appearance and broken grin. To most hivers, these crystals are nothing more than fancy baubles, and their owners and placement throughout the hive completely random. However, there are those who argue otherwise, especially once they've downed a few bottles of wild snake. The rumour mongers claim that Bald Brian serves dark masters, and his crystals are part of some far-reaching plan to bring about the Chrono Catalysm. And what is the Chrono Catalysm? Well, that varies depending on which drunken conspiracy theorist you ask. Some will tell you it is a plot by the immortal cult of Necrovanda to bring about a psychic awakening of all humanity or perhaps a plan by the ancient Iron Lords of the Aranus Continuity to free Necromunda from the yoke of the Imperium. Others whisper that Rust Town was created by House Arthanus, that Brian is in fact Brian Arthanus, last true heir of his family, and the crystals are intended to turn back time and restore his bloodline. And then there are those who say that he's actually an agent of the throne and they suggest his bonds have already come to pass, and they're all living in an alternate reality, created by the Ordo Kronos. Whatever reality it may be, Rust Town's still good for a laugh. <laughs> There are hundreds of ruined domes, abandoned levels, and derelict factorums. These are places of peril, where hivers try not to linger on their way to established settlements, or, if they have any sense at all, never visit in the first place. The Underhive of Hive Primus is home to hundreds of settlements and homesteads, 
Some, like Iron Tree, Ruffix Folly, and the Tangle, are built into the fabric of the hive. Their streets hanging over yawning pits or latched onto the side of the primary heat sink. Others, like Dust Falls, Bruner's Dome, or Port Mad Dog, guard gates, tunnels, and bridges leading from one zone or another, their inhabitants growing rich off trade between clans and gangs. A few, most notably Misfortune and Rust Town, are held together by the singular will of a powerful individual and survive in spite of their location or the industries of the Underhive. Then, there are the Bad Zones. These are the wastelands between established towns and holes where old trails and tunnels link one place to another. But, there is little in the way of human habitation. Outlaws, muties, and outlanders often call the Bad Zones home, having been driven out of more civilized society to eke out an existence among the rats and ripperjacks. Raiders, be they human or otherwise, are the least of the horrors the Bad Zone have to offer, and faulty machinery, shambling horrors, and carnivorous fungi can all kill the hiver as quickly as an outlaw's bullet, if you're lucky. The alternative is life as a plague zombie, or an excruciatingly slow death in the vines of a venom gorse forest. Among the various bad zones, there are regions with particularly dire reputations. This is quite a feat when you consider the underhive also contains spiders literally the sizes of houses. Perhaps the worst of these is the Ruin, a bad zone that sprawls out along the Underhive, roughly midway between Dust Falls and the Hive Bottom. This No Man's Land is a haunted waste, filled with every conceivable horror the Underhive has to offer. It is also a known hideout of Chaos Cults and Xenos worshippers, there being some who say that in its depths whole alien armies are being mustered, awaiting the day when they may rise up and tear Hive Primus down. Only the boldest of gangs dare to brave the ruin, often on the promise of creds from the guild or some crime boss. As a known boat hole for outlaws, it also attracts its fair share of bounty hunters, lone killers scouring the bad zone for signs of prey. Most of those who go into the ruin do not return, and if they do, they come back scarred, missing limbs or having been driven mad by the things they've seen. In addition to outlaws and murderers, not to mention rats the size of cyber mastiffs, the ruin is filled with the kinds of peril that are only possible when complex artificial environments are subjected to thousands of years of neglect and pollution. Machines and servitors that once faithfully served mankind become hazards, their mindless routines fatal to anyone who gets in their way. After all, a monotask servitor whose only job it is to screw lumens into the ceiling of a dome may seem harmless unless it decides a ganger looks a lot like a lumen. The failure of these environments and their systems has also given birth to all manner of hostile flora from carnivorous plants to slump jellies, leading to the popular hive saying, just because it doesn't have a mouth doesn't mean it can't eat you. The ruin is a haven for those individuals deemed unsuitable to live among civilized society, which is really saying something if you've ever visited the latrine pits in Dust Falls 
or seen a bar fight in Port Mad Dog end in automatic weapons fire. Gangs of escaped slaves and pit fighters make homes among the ruins, fighting to survive on rat meat and wall scrapings against corrupted servitors and mutant monstrosities. From the edges of the bad zone, they raid established settlements, dragging their loot and captives back into the shadows. As bad as ratskin renegades and muty warbands might be, perhaps the most feared residents of the ruin are the living dead. One of the reasons travelers avoid the ruin like the plague is because of the actual plague. Known as the Neuron Virus, believed to be the remnant of some ancient Dark Age bioweapon, or perhaps the influence of some malign power, it can turn humans and critters alike into brain-dead zombies. The ruin is a well-known nest of the infected, with the occasional herd of the undead shambling out onto the sentry guns of two tunnels or trying to claw its way up the abyss into dust falls. All this would be bad enough if they weren't psychers with the power to command those afflicted with the neuron virus and turn them into their own personal army. In the ruin, the dubious honour of being named Lord of the Dead belongs to Karloth Valois. An off-worlder, Karloth was drawn to Necromunda by the Mercantur Pallidus, and once served the rulers of the Corpse Guild. When his dark, psychic gifts were uncovered, he was forced to flee down Hive, where some claim he contracted the Neuron Plague, becoming something altogether more and less than he was. Able to command those touched by the plague and spread it through the hive, it was only a matter of time before Karloff was declared under hive enemy number one. Despite the fact the redemption claim to have killed the necromancer more than once, depending on who you ask, rumours say he still lives within the ruin, biding his time, plotting his revenge. Scum always finds its way to the sun. This is as true with billions of liters of human effluent, factorum waste, and promethium runoff as it is of its hivers. And down in the depths of the hive, where even the weak light of the great lumens don't shine, there are whole towns of scum fighting and scavenging to stay alive. Down. The abyss from dust falls, past the tunnels to Rust Town, Spoil Heap, and Port Mad Dog. The underhive grows dark. Deeper still, beneath the Delta Seven bad zones and the old ratskin trail to the White Wastes, the abyss lives up to its name, and the light of dust falls is hidden by miles of twisted tunnel. Finally. Beyond the road to two tunnels and the tangle, the abyss reaches its end, opening up over the vastness of the hive bottom and the frontier settlement of some city. Rising up from the toxic sea around it, some city is the last part of call for gangs and gilders. Those who come here looking to seek wealth out in the midnight expanse of the hive bottom are to sail out onto the sump sea in search of the sump spiders and their priceless diamond eyes. The trick, as any spider hunter will tell you, is getting the spider to part with its eyes. Sump City's only connection to the underhive is a series of ancient cable cars. The battered gondolas ferrying hivers up to the lowest levels of the abyss. For here, they can make the long journey back up to Dust Falls. Despite thin, poisonous air, cam clouds that would make a Goliath's eyes water and regular moon raids, 
Some city is almost as prosperous as dust falls. The wealth brought in by the spider hunters, the architects, scavengers, and the sunk prospectors ensures its scrap markets are filled with rare and valuable items. Traders from the two tunnels, from part Mad Dog and from Dust Falls, ferry the best of these goods up to the abyss and sell it on to the guilds. There's a substantial markup, of course. This is largely possible because there are no formal merchant guild presences in some city, despite agents of the Guild of Coin and the Guild of Slaves frequenting its streets, the settlement has always been run by one gang or another. Up until recently, Sadie Original Sin and the some city sirens did the job, though nobody has seen the sirens for a while. Sadie's gold-plated boulder was seen recently for sale in the Haggle of Dust Falls, but it probably just bode too well for her continued existence. Recently, the Carrion Queens and the Iron Lords have been juggling over this great settlement. One of the principal industries of some city is the trade in giant spider eyes. Spy nobles will pay a small fortune for these precious gems, and the largest worth enough for a slime drift captain to move up high and live out their days in luxury. Harvesting the spider eyes, however, is no easy feat. The larger the spider, the greater the challenge. Even an amateur some spider is usually the size of a slave hawker, and the largest as big as an Orlock battle rig, gun turrets and all. With this in mind, serious hunters sail out in massive armored scrap ships, often with flotillas of smaller craft to act as lookouts and bait men, to herd the spider towards the big ship's gas harpoons. Of course, this is not always enough, and on the docks of some city, where hundreds of battered ships, barges, and boats of all kinds hang over the inky blackness of the sump, I've cut some sailors like to spin yarns of the ones that got away. The tale of the Hydra, and its captain, Hagen Valgolfa, is perhaps the most consistent of these sagas. And so the story goes, Valgolfa and his ship, the Hydra, were the greatest spider hunters to ever sail out of some city. Each cycle, his crew brought in the largest hauls of spider eyes, and the grizzled old veteran could have retired many times over. But Valgolfa was hunting a legend great albino spider. Time and time again, the Hydra went out hunting the beast, and time and time again, its captain returned empty-handed. Until one day, when the Hydra was overdue by many cycles, then a member of Valgotha's crew was found drifting on the sump, all alone and mad with fear. Valgotha had at last found his nemesis, the man claimed. He had seen both gigantic spider and some captain sink beneath the slime. Valgotha still hacking at the beast's massive diamond eyes, even as the black claimed him. While some hive has come to some city to crew slime drifters and trade in spider eyes, might have come to hunt for Archaeotech. It is a widely accepted truth of the underhive that the lower you go, the better your chances of finding great wealth become. While it's also true that going lower means better loot, it also means that the tentacles don't have to reach so far. Gilders and nobles and crown bosses regularly hire gangs to head out into the wilds of the high bottom in search of lost treasures. These can be anything from tech left over from centuries past to veins of valuable scrap or pools of concentrated calicles, rare underhive fungi, or even sub-monsters for the fighting pits.